How are you doing? This is David W. Williams. And what we're going to talk about today is will the black crowdfunding model die out? And the reason why I'm talking about this is I want to help you get a better understanding of the scope of the markets, what's actually going on out here in the world, and to kind of broaden your horizons around finance and the markets and what is actually going on offline. So when you get presented with these situations in the real world, you don't have this myopia based on just what you've seen on the Internet. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. Now, really quickly. We're still doing the event. Get some skills to take the deal 2024. That's going to be on April 27th in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to cut off sales for that particular event Saturday, probably late in the evening. And that's going to be Saturday, my time on the East Coast. Everything presented in that event is going to be going at a much higher price point in the future. The goal of that event is to launch those two people out into the space and put them in a position to where they get more exposure. And they can also put themselves in a position to launch their own situations and to also test out the offer that I'm going to be doing around lead options and how to really take advantage of the index utilizing lead options. That information is going to be at a much higher price point in the future because of the power of what that particular situation is. It's currently what I'm doing in the markets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach it there. They're going to get it at a really, really steep discount. Then when I relaunch, it's going to be at a much higher price point. So it doesn't matter when you get it, the value of the content will still exceed the price point. Because what I'm really trying to do and everything I've been trying to do in this channel is to set you up for long term success in the markets because you actually understand what's going on. So, like I said before, I'm going to close off the ability to buy that Saturday in the evening, my time. So after that, we'll no longer be taking any new sales and we're going to just continue to move forward. So let's get back to what we're talking about today. Will the black crowdfunding model die out? Now, we heard a lot after the Tulsa situation collapsed that. It's going to be the end of black crowdfunding and people are saying, well, you know what, when the next black person pops up and they have a fund, nobody's going to believe them because of what Jay Morrison did in this little situation with Tulsa. And I think that's kind of inflammatory, but I understand now how the Internet works. You have to be very extreme to get people's attention. If you are moderate online, it's very difficult to get people's attention because they're looking for extremism, right, to get their attention, right, to kind of rattle their cage. However, in the real world, and it's kind of where we operate is in the real world. I don't believe the model will die out because the model existed before Jay Morrison. Therefore, the model will exist after Jay Morrison. I don't think there's anything that can happen in Tulsa that can be so detrimental to the space that it's going to take the whole space down. I'm kind of show you some real life examples of what I'm talking about. Then people said that people are claiming that the real estate investors should have invested in what we call a REIT which is going to be a real estate investment trust, right? And people are saying, well, you know what? They could have gotten those same returns if they invested in a REIT. And again, it kind of shows the lack of exposure to the markets. And that's why I asked people this morning, how many years of school were they taught capitalism? Many people answered back and they were taught economics. I didn't ask that question. I asked, were you taught capitalism? So that's like somebody telling me, I say, well, were you ever taught to dunk? And somebody says, well, yeah, I was taught basketball. I didn't ask you if you were taught basketball. I asked you, have you ever been taught how to dunk? So we have a country to where people really don't understand capitalism, right? But they're made to operate in this particular space. But they've never been taught the actual theory or practice of what they need to operate in. It's very interesting, but that's where we have it, right? So... Telling someone that they should have invested in a REIT that believed in what they thought the mission of the fund was really doesn't add up to me because I understand the difference between a REIT. I understand the difference between this particular fund. So the fund had a narrative on it, just like if you invest in ARC, each ARC fund has a different narrative, right? So you're investing in that narrative. You're not just investing to get a yield. You believe in a narrative. So ARC has a biotech fund. You believe in the future of the biotech space. So you invest in that particular fund. ARC has a tech fund. You invest, you believe in the potential of technology, artificial intelligence, things of that nature. So you invest in that specific fund, right? And so that's what people may not understand or just may not be communicating properly. If I was investing in a fund because I believed in the narrative that people were giving me, right? That's not equivalent to me investing in a REIT that's just going out to get commercial property, right? Or going out to get beach property, yada, yada, yada. It's not the same thing. So the question you want to ask yourself is what is social investing? 
because what we were sold with the Tulsa was just social investing, right? And so what is social investing? And then do you believe in social investing? And you have to kind of answer those questions. That's why I asked the person that got on the phone, not got on the phone, but got on the microphone last week. What was your reason why you invested in this particular fund? Right. Because if you don't understand why they did it, then you'll never understand what was the rationale behind what they did. Because because I understand the markets, I always understand where you can go get a return on capital at. Right. You're never going to run out in America. You're never going to run out of place to get returns on your capital. Right. At least for the people that are in our pay scale. I'm not sitting on billions of dollars, I'm not even sitting on tens of million. Right. So based on my position in the market, I'm never going to run out of place to get a return on my capital. So then the question is, if you're into social investing, why would you go after REIT if you're into social investing, which is what the Tesla was promoted to us as, right? As a social investment crowdfund. So, so socially responsible investing is a practice of investing money in companies and funds that have a positive social impact. So if a person tells you, we're going to try to rehabilitate or stop gentrification in predominantly black areas and that's what we're doing and i believe in that then why would i go invest in a reit that doesn't do that like the reit could say i can invest in a reit that says hey we buy a commercial property on beachfronts and we manage those and we get a yield and we pay you back some of the yield that we get well that's not the same thing as saying hey we're going to go buy properties in predominantly black areas and we're going to rehabilitate them put them back in the market because we understand that everybody's coming after these particular areas and we don't have any exposure to this particular space because we don't have the capital, right? It's not the same thing. So if you don't believe in socially responsible investing, that's cool. But if a person does believe in socially responsible investing, why would they go invest in a REIT? But you have to understand the difference between the two. If you don't understand the difference between the two, then you just, it's whatever. Like I said before, is I don't believe in barbershop conversations because you go into the barbershop and you really don't learn anything. You just listen to people just run their mouth. But if that's where you're at with it, then that's just where you're at with it, right? But I don't go into barbershops. I haven't gone to barbershops ever since I was like in my early 20s because I had more things to do on Saturday than just listen to people run their mouth. I'd rather go play basketball. I don't have six hours to spend to just listen to people talk in circles, right? That just never was my get down. And so that's, to me, what a lot of the conversations are on the internet. It's just people just talking just to say something but then when you start really asking them, like, what do you really mean by this, yada, yada, they can't explain it because they're just talking. It's just words, right? So when you are investing or you're looking to get a yield, do you want to invest in companies that actually re reflect your values? And that's the question you got to ask yourself. If I'm looking to get a yield out of a particular company, or I'm looking to invest, I'm sorry, am I doing it just because of the number that I'm looking to get? Or do I want to invest in companies that reflect my values? Right. Or do I want to have some type of um, impact on what that company does? Right. So maybe two years ago now, I was talking to people on this channel about buying bonds and how by buying bonds in a government, you now can impact the policy of the government because the government owes you money. Right. And so you have to take the risk that they won't pay you back. But this is how people get influence over governments is they buy their debt and therefore they're now married to the government. Right. So you got to kind of understand what are you looking to get out of investing? Are you looking to just get a number? Or are you looking to invest in something that kind of reflects your values? And then the next question you want to ask yourself, are you willing to take a lower yield and return for positive social impact? And so these are the kind of questions you want to ask yourself. So we have this space now, but it's been going on for years uh, called ESG. And people are looking to invest in ESG funds because of how that's composed. You got some that are based around being carbon free, yada, yada, yada. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So here's something that we call fossil free funds. So these are funds that don't invest in companies that have anything to do with fossil fossil fuels right and so that's what this particular group of funds is targeted towards then you got funds that are based around being carbon free so you're looking to invest in comp companies or organizations that really limit their carbon footprint right 
Then you have Vanguard, which is they they have over a trillion dollars uh, under their particular organization, which is called AUM. And they have a whole specific groups of funds called ESG investing because they understand how popular this type of investing has. So when you're dealing with the millennial investor, you're dealing with an investor. And we notice because of uh, years and years of focus groups and reaching out to them, millennial investors, right, are often more concerned with their connection to an organization and whether or not they believe in the values of that particular company. They're often not just looking for a yield at the end of the day. So we're dealing with a new class of investor, right, to where they're very much concerned with the business that the country is operating, the, the business that the company is involved in, not just do I get a return on my capital. So to serve that particular part of the market, the big funds started figuring out how can we produce products based around that particular narrative, right? So this is kind of where the world is going where people are interested in putting money behind things that are important to them. They're not just only interested in how much money does a particular fund make at the end of the day. But you got to be having these type of conversations and understand that these things are even available to you to know that you can do it. But Vanguard, which is a reputable, long-term uh, investing organization, they even will allow you to get exposure to this type of stuff. So this is not anything like left-wing or right-wing. This is coming out of Vanguard, Right which is as vanilla as you can get from an investing standpoint. So you got to really understand once you kind of get past a lot of the talking points and the hot button stuff. So then you also have Nerd Wallet, seven best performing ESG funds and seven cheapest ESG ETFs for April 2024. And then they just go into all of them. That's Vanguard, Barron, Newberger, Calvert, William Blair, Amana Growth, American Century Growth. These are five-year returns. So these returns are not great over five years because you can buy the overall index and get better five-year returns than this. But the question is, are you buying this because you're looking just to get a return? Or are you buying it because you believe in what they're doing? And you want to put your money behind companies that reflect your values. So then the question is, what are your values? OK. Keep going. If we want to invest in companies that promote black people into the C-suite, how do we do that? So that's a question to the audience, as opposed to arguing with people over DEI. Right. If we want to invest in companies that promote black people into the C-suite, how do we do that? Right? So to me, this should be a very um, non-complicated question. Right? And so these are the kind of things that we're missing out on because if somebody was to come to you and say, well, we want to put black people, we want to make sure that black people get higher level executive jobs how can we marshal our investing capital to do that? And you have no answers. Well, then you just told them that it's really not that important to you. So then everything just keeps moving on the way it's been going. Right. So that's what I try to get people to understand is that you have to be able to communicate a solution to a problem to actually be able to solve the problem. It can't just be I'm upset about something. But then when somebody asks me, OK, how do we solve this particular problem? I haven't really thought about what I want the solution to be. So then there is no solution and they just move on because obviously the problem is not big enough if you haven't figured out how we can actually solve this problem. So if we're going to get rid of DEI, we're going to get rid of diversity, the other one and inclusion. I forgot what the, other, the E is. We're going to wipe this out, out of corporations. How do we invest in companies that are going to promote black people into the C-suite? How do we do that? Because we got to figure out another way to make sure that our people in these organizations are able to get economic mobility. Right. But it, it, it comes down to what do we believe is important. So you tell people what you believe is important by what you're focused on and in what you have the ability to participate in and in what you're pushing. If not, then they, they know you're just lying. But like I said, it's different between the real world and the Internet. So this is going to be something that is going to be real world. And this stuff on the Internet is just Internet stuff. Right. And so you tell people what you're on by what you're involved in. I do real world stuff. I also do Internet but my footprint is always going to be bigger in the real world than it is on the internet. Cause I can't, I can't win in the internet. Like I just can't, I can't win on the internet. Right. I don't have the ability to. Next question. Do you believe you should put demands on your investing capital outside of yield? Again, if you're investing in a company, do you believe that you should put demands on your investing capital outside of the yield? So I'm not here to say that you should make yield important. 
But are there any other demands that you want to put on your capital? Do you are you aware that you can put demands on your capital? Right. So if I wanted to put a fund together and I said, we're going to just buy the index. So we're going to just mirror the index. Right. However, the goal is to raise so much money. To where we can do what Buffett does, where Buffett sits down with management of the organization. And he low key kind of tells them how things are going to go. Especially if it's a struggling company. Now, if he invests in Apple, he don't have the ability to do that. But often when Buffett would invest in a struggling organization, before he would do it, he would sit down with management and he would tell them, hey, if you want my capital, like this is how you have to operate your organization. Right. And so if we were to raise a certain amount of money, we would have the ability to go and put. To influence how they run the organization based on the amount of money that we put into the organization and you don't have to have a 90 percent hold on it in some of these organizations if you can get 10 15 percent of shares you can be the largest individual shareholder as a group then you can start to dictate how they run the organization so is there any demand that you put on your investing capital outside of yield now i know it's going to be difficult because you're one person which is why people aggregate their money right so then you don't have to argue with nobody over DEI or over the fact that they don't want to promote black women because you've made a stipulation of your investment that they have a particular policy in the way in which they deal with certain people. And it is nothing to be argued about. And if they don't like the way we do it, then you just pull your money out of the deal and you go find another place that wants your money. See, so you understand why the conversation always has to be something outside of these things. Because you're not even supposed to know that these things even take place. But other people will dictate policy based on their money. So let me give an example. This is going to be using a celebrity, but I want you to get an example of influence. There's this female basketball player playing for this college. And as an ex-NBA player that's made a ridiculous amount of money in sports and in business, like ridiculous amount of money, it's something that's not talked about. This guy's worth a lot of money. People don't know it because they see him all the time. But this guy's worth a lot of money. He has a lot of interest in business. So this female basketball player playing at this college that the guy is an alumni of was having issues with the program. The word I got was they was getting ready to run her out of the program. He's one of their biggest boosters. He told them she's not going anywhere or else my money's going to leave right after she leaves. So you know what happened? She stayed in the program. Because he's not just giving them their money because he don't have nothing else to do. He wants to impact the situation, which is got goals with the money they take from him. Right. I took a course years ago called Issues in Sports. It was a coach for Texas named Mac Brown. The boosters told him who to who to hire as a defensive coordinator. He didn't hire that guy as the D coordinator. They didn't have a great season. They fired Mac Brown because they told him we told you who to hire as the D coordinator. We told you who to hire. You didn't hire the person we told you to hire. It didn't work. We're going to fire your ass. Because with their money comes what? Their influence. They just don't give you their money just because they want to give you their money. They won't say so on what happens with their money. You understand me? So when you don't have those particular type of, you don't have that perspective on the world, you don't even know you can not even start putting those type of demands on your participation because you don't even know that people do this type of stuff. They do it every day. They do it to politicians. They do it to business, yada, yada, yada. So I can raise a big fund and say, hey, we're going to put money in this particular area. And then we're going to put demands on them based on the fact that we have our money in this particular area. But it has to be what you want to do. If you don't want to do it, nobody's going to try to make you do it because that's less resistance they're going to get from anybody. But they still get access to your money. Right. And you can do it not just with investing. You can do it with the fact that you buy stuff from these people. But it has to be what is important to you, right? So it was the boosters that got that Haitian-American woman removed from Harvard. It was the people that donate to Harvard that got her pulled out of there, right? Because they told Harvard, if you don't get that woman out of there, the money going to get cut off. And she was gone. Because in the real world, you can marry a white man, that don't make you no white woman. 
that's how the real world right now. I know the internet tell you something different, but in the real world, yes, you get a lot of access by marrying two white people. It don't make you white. So as soon as she stepped wrong with them people, they got her ass up out of there. That's how the game go. Right? So they use their money and they put demands on their money with Harvard to get that woman out of there. And I'm not celebrating she's gone. I'm just saying that's how the game works. So what I want to show you something is that we're talking about crowdfunding in the black space. And people are saying, well, the next time somebody comes up with a deal because of what Morrison did, it's going to kill it. So there's a, a, a website that somebody hit me to because they told me about this particular project in Alexandria, right? So I got a family that lives in Alexandria, really, really nice area. For people that know the Central Florida area, really the Orlando area, Alexandria kind of reminds me of Winter Park. It's really, really nice. It's very expensive to live in. So I got family that lives there, been living there when it was low-key expensive, and they just rolled it out to where now it's uber expensive living in Alexandria. So they've gotten a lot of appreciation in property value. So they hit me to this deal, right? And so it was on this particular website. Now, what you have on this website is projects. you got affordable housing, minority-led projects, women-led, creative economy, sustainable, and in everything. And these people are essentially using that crowdfunding exemption that was created by Obama, where anybody like over 18 can invest in these projects and you don't have to be a accredited investor. Now, some of these are going to require that you're going to be an accredited investor, but most of them don't, right? So there's all these different projects. So this guy right here, he's an Anglo, but he's over an organization that is designed to get women, and I believe what they're classifying as minorities, into this particular area of Boston, right? And they've talked about, if you watch the video, and because it's on Firefox, the video audio won't play well, that historically black people have been cut out of these type of deals. So that's why they put this deal together, right? So here's one in Roseland, Chicago, right? So this brother wants to buy up this shopping center in the Roseland area. It's right by the hospital. Got the little video right here showing you what he wants to do. So it's open to everybody. They're trying to raise $100,000. Uh, 63,000 raised, 19 invested with 23 days left to raise, 49% cash flow, 49% profit share, black owned, preferred equity, long term investment horizon, closes May 10th, 2024, which means it's not going to take that long to close, right? So this is something that has a black perspective on it, right? But it's still a crowdfund. So again, even though what happened in the Tulsa was very, very unfortunate, it's not going to stop anything. Because you have people in this particular space, and this is his second funding for this Roseland deal, that know what they're doing. They have a track record in the space, and they're doing it, right? So this guy, Roseland, also did this Edmondson Village in Baltimore, Maryland. This guy's building tiny homes in Oakwood, Texas. I don't know where that's at, right? This has been up for a while in Evanston. She still hasn't been able to raise her money. This also Walbrook Junction in Baltimore, Maryland. So this guy's really big in the commercial space. This lady's out of Philly, right? This woman's out of B-more. This guy also Oakwood, Texas, doing tiny cabins, right? This is in San Francisco. I don't know who would want to put money into that market right now, but you know, you might get on the ground floor. You never know. She finally got funded. This is in Detroit. This is in D.C. This is still in Philly. She's doing another project. This is a guy, Asian guy, uh, Rosewood in L.A. So if you look at the numbers, and this is going to be for the Rose, the Roseland Center in Chicago, right? It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years for you to get everything back out of your investment. Now, I don't know because I've never been in these type of deals. Do you still get equity in the property? But for them to pay you back with the cash flows, right, out of the particular initial investment, it's going to take like nine years. So this is a long-term deal. This is not a short-term deal. And this, this right here, this is what we call a pro forma, is if everything goes right. So if we don't go into a recession, uh, if they don't have any issues with contractors, if there's not any issues with the government in Chicago, if everything goes right, it'll take nine years for you to get all your money back. And I mean to get back your initial investment plus the profit that you're supposed to get out of this deal. They got it per thousand investor. And they got it for a person that invested ten thousand dollars. So the majority of the money that you get back comes on the back end year seven, eight, nine, and ten. So this is a long term play, but this has been going on for years. And right, this website called Small Change. They got all different type of projects, right? So I would encourage you if you want to look at this, look into it. I'm not an affiliate of them, 
I'm not promoting it. I'm just saying it's information so you can have a better understanding of the space because these people are not on the internet. They're doing this in real life. And so one thing I learned by being on the internet is that there is a dichotomy. There's people that everything is the internet. And so they think everything is the internet. And I saw that with like my, my younger relatives. This is like a decade ago. And I realized that if it don't happen on the internet to them, it didn't happen. So they was they had to like put everything online because in their mind, if it don't happen on social, it didn't happen, right? But what's interesting is that older people picked up that same attitude, right? So they've got influenced by really at that time was millennials, young millennials, that if it don't happen on the internet, it's like it didn't happen. There's stuff going on in this real world all day, every day that's never going to happen on the internet, right? It's never going to happen. And so that's what I want you to understand is that just because it's the talk of the online, it's the talk of the social media space. It, it may have very little the, the impact offline because there's people doing these type of deals using this particular exception created by Obama. They're using these deals to finance and to get people into different opportunities. And they're going to keep doing it until they close out that, that loophole. And I don't think that's ever going to happen because it was designed to allow people to get into these type of structures and not have to be an accredited investor sitting on a whole lot of money. So that's kind of what we wanted to talk about. Are you investing? Let's say you go into one of these deals and we're trying to improve this particular area. So let's look at the Roseland deal. We're trying to improve this particular area. So building block wealth through community owned shopping centers. If you're doing this just to get a yield, if everything is just the percentage return I can get on capital, this may not be the deal for you. Because, you know, you're going to lock your money up for almost a decade. And then maybe if it was a lock your money up for a decade, if you're just trying to get yield, you can get better returns in something else, in another vehicle. But if you want to try to improve this particular area, right, you can participate in this particular situation. And then you can hope over the next decade that everything goes in the direction that you wanted to go, because it's about this particular scenario that is important to you, not just the yield. Right. And so these are the kind of questions you got to kind of ask yourself, because we get upset when other people come in and gentrify our environments. But then the question is, what are we doing to try to turn these situations around? Because we got a lot of people that understand real estate. How come we put money behind them? So the guy on social media is not the only person that knows real estate. Trust me when I tell you that. There's people in your city right now that are no real estate. Why are you put no bread behind them? Right. And those are the kind of questions you got to kind of ask yourself. So that's going to be it. We're not going to be here long because we're not going to belabor the point. If anybody got any um, comments, anything that they want to talk about, let me know. I'm going to put that link up and then we're going to get up on out of here. That's up. Okay, that's pinned. Okay, so anybody got any disagreements, comments, yada, 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 come through. I'm going to read these super chats and we're going to keep it pushing. I said, we got Miss Michelle. Miss Michelle, give me one second. Hello. 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 Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I was waiting for you. I'm sorry. It's Good evening. Man. Thank you for having me on your panel today, Mr. Diamond. Uh, I just want to thank you for this. I want to thank you for your program. I appreciate you not um, going at us, Tulsa investors, in terms of those who openly shared what we went through. Because I do see online saying people we should have known better. We were too emotional, on and so on and so on. Instead of badgering us you gave us a forum to share our experience um to, to discuss it to process it and offer a way to move forward so i just want to appreciate you for that no problem yeah don't uh, it's not a big deal and don't let people tell you too emotional especially not men uh there's probably nobody more emotional than men thank you thank you so again i'm going to look into this when i'm ready to re-enter that space i'll probably look into something this like this again 
I'm gonna get Ale Alexandria, Virginia. Was it because I'm from that area? I live in Bowie, Maryland. I live right outside of DC. Okay, I was I like, you. Alexandria's right around the corner. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so not a corner, but you know, across the Beltway. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I have family that lives up there. Um, okay. So it's a nice area. I haven't been to Maryland. Uh, okay. I only I only go to see them. Um, but yeah. Okay, they live in the Virginia side. Yeah, or? they live in the they live in Alexandria, Virginia side. They live on the Virginia side, so they live. Okay. You know, right outside of DC because they work in DC, so they do live in the VA okay. side. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. I, I, I'm just curious. Did you ever at least come to the National Harbor while you were on while you were visiting here? No. Nah, when I was in Alexandria, what I like about Virginia and even before I moved it is there's a lot of history there because you know because of Jamestown. So when oh, I yes. was in Alexandria, yeah. I saw um, I forgot the name of this place, but I, I'm interested in a lot of the history of child slaves in Virginia. Because it's yes. so ancient, so old. So mm -hmm. I, I was last when I was there, I was going to a lot of those particular uh, museums and trying to find those particular locations in the city. Because there's one okay. location, if you're aware of, in Alexandria to where these men would find people who no longer had use for their for the people they had in slavery. And they were looking to sell them and they were marching from VA down to a slave market in Louisiana. So they have the location in Alexandria where they held those people until they got ready to march them down. So I went there to see it, but I didn't really have the time um, to really examine it fully because there's a lot of things like you can go to Jamestown, uh, Virginia also being the capital of the Confederacy. Like there's a lot of history there that you can really dig into, but it just, I need to go there and spend like two weeks. Oh, definitely. Have you been to the National Museum here? Have not. Like I haven't the been National to anything in, in D.C. OK, well, like, I don't know. I'll follow. I, of course, I follow you. So if you ever say you're coming up here, I'll try to see if I can meet you at one of these spaces because, you know, because of work and stuff will be nice, you know, if you are right. But you're yeah, definitely, definitely as a you can subscriber. Do that. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, if you yeah, ever just, decide, you yeah, announce, you'll make an announcement. I may, I may do like an announcement and just do an event because, like I said, I haven't seen anything in D.C. Because mm -hmm. uh, when I mm -hmm. saw the Iwo Jima monument, I was surprised how big it was. I didn't think it was that big. It's like it's like those people are gigantic. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, definitely. But I haven't seen anything in DC because my people live in Alexandria. And so I just, mm -hmm. when I'm out there, I'm just out there. I'm not okay. really in DC like that uh, for you know any reason because I don't really like DC sports teams. So there's no reason for me to really go into the city outside of going to the museum. <laughs> yeah, I had family that used to live in Virginia, like Northern Virginia, but a lot of them moved further out into Virginia because of, you know, they started families and it was just getting cheaper, gentrification issues. So, the black population out when I was growing up that was in that area has dispersed. Understand. Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's that's 100 yeah, so, percent correct. So that's yeah. something also I've been paying attention to from the people that stay out there is how they gentrified uh DC. Um and they're gonna tend to continue to keep doing that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Cause like even like um my cousin went to high school at a major high school in that area. A lot of, lot, when I was growing up, a lot of African-American young boys used to play football, but now it's totally different. But that's a whole nother conversation for another day. But again, I'm I'm gonna watch, I'm watching you. I appreciate you. And thank you for letting me come on. No, ma'am, take it easy. Have a good day. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How you doing today, brother? I'm doing all right. How you feel? Man, I'm awesome. I'm awesome, man. First of all, uh, like always, I appreciate having the opportunity to come on the show or whatnot. But at the end of the day, I like what did Swaggy Swaggy really do wrong? He gave people what they wanted. They wanted somebody to believe in. They wanted a a, a mentor, a <laughs> activist. I mean, he he he's a chameleon. He gave everybody uh, what they wanted. Um, but one of the best things that I really enjoy about your show that a lot of people I think really miss out. And it shows that you really are who you are because you you don't so much promote yourself. You you promote reading, self-study. So I think anytime you get involved in any type of activity, you really need to read, study, read, study, and study some more. So um, I really don't want to make my comments too long, but I just want everybody to listen, man. If y'all really looking for somebody who's really here to help y'all out, most definitely come to the event, you know, come to Dave's uh, event on the 27th. And then next, next week, Erica has an event. So you, these are two people who are really for the community. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I'm going to be at Erica's event, too. So I'm going to do mine and then run back. Shoot, uh, shoot I really hope people. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Correct. So I, re 
I really hope people come support you, brother, because you really are out here giving people the tools to really help themselves. So, like I said, I don't want to be too long, man. But uh, uh, that's that's the key. You got to read and study, and that's it. So I could. So before you go, let me ask you a question. So you knew yes, about sir. the Tulsa Fund. How come you decided to either invest or not invest? Like, what was your rationale behind it? <sighs> wow. Um, I'm beyond. I mean, it's kind of. It, Obviously, you would know, I mean, just by listening to you and we kind of I kind of have understanding. We kind of grew up the same. I just had it's a I just had a feeling about that, brother. You know what I'm saying? Doing research on him and, and having an understanding, a discernment about who he is. You know, I'm not saying he's a bad guy, but I mean, being around people, I, I knew what was going on, you know, yeah. and I knew it wasn't for me. So uh if I ever get that feeling or if you, if somebody can't explain something to me easily as it like a third grader, that's like, come on, man, you probably be able to break it down quick. You know, this is what you're doing. Why can't you explain it to me in a simple way as if I'm a third grader, you know? So it, if you really look back, it was a lot of red flags, but I think a lot of times people, they see what they want to see you know, and uh, whatever part, and that's his talent, man, whatever, whatever you want to see, he'll play that part for you. So, I mean, and that, that is his talent. So to be honest with you, he, this ain't, this ain't going to stop him in, in a few years, he's going to be back on something bigger and better, you know? So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's what it is, man. But uh, that, that was the main reason for me. I, I could, I could just kind of smell that out from a, uh, uh, <laughs> A, a mile away so but uh that, that was my reason i feel you i understand all right man so i really appreciate you coming through and i appreciate your, your, your commentary and if you need something let me know man i'm gonna get to the next person yes sir yes sir always man blessings to you man can't wait to see you uh next week all right man be easy yes sir peace so let me see okay they dropped off okay so anybody else want to come up let me know we're gonna read these uh super chats and we're gonna get up on out here read some of these comments so ray gun man appreciate the two dollars mr johnson Appreciate the 199 Super Chat. Uh, Mr. Harvey, appreciate the 499 VIP courses. 100, definitely it is. Uh, put a lot into it. Mr. Uh, Ashe, if that's how I pronounce it, is it Ash? Appreciate the 1999 Super Chat. So, Miss Coach Truer, appreciate the uh, coming through. Mr. Bass, appreciate you coming through. Flo Jersey, appreciate you coming through. Miss Celeste Coles, 930. What's up to North Carolina? Miss Phoenix 91, what's going on? How you feel? Thanks for uh, the feedback on the intro. So, Miss Yoni, I think they'll be more transparent. Let's see how it goes. So, Roddy Rod says, the model not dying out. It's a market for what he does, and people always buy into said model. I feel you. GC, what's going on? So, Miss Michelle Green, how you feel? So you say you may do a little bit of the portfolio for ESG. Yeah, that's kind of like the thing now. You know, let's see how long that runs, though. So Michelle says the state of Texas pulled funds away from BlackRock due to them wanting to do ESG with Texas Capital. And they got a right to do that. You know, they have a right to do that. You know, it's, it's their money. They have a right to do whatever they want to do with it. You know, but um, I think the funds are going after a different category of investor. Because, you know, in... You know, the guy that runs BlackRock, I don't know if he's a boomer, but in like 25, 30 years, the investment space is going to be totally different than what it currently is now because of just demographics. So I just think they're they're positioning themselves for how a newer investor is going to see the world, you know, and I think that's very difficult for people uh, sometimes to see that things are changing in front of them and what they've been doing is on the way out. And I think it can be very hard. I see a lot of that in entertainment, people being resistant to that stuff. I've never had that issue uh, because I don't expect people that are so many years younger than me to, to see things the way I see it. I don't have no expectation that they're going to do that, right? Because I know how I was when they was their age. I didn't see things the way my parents saw it. But I just think people have a resistance to that type of stuff. Uh, younger people are investing for different reasons and they're also buying and shopping for different reasons than what people did 25, 30 years ago. It's just how the world works, in my opinion. So it said, Vu is doing good for you. Vu's doing good for a lot of people. I was doing good for Vanguard. 
right? They make a lot of money AUM just managing uh, big index funds. They don't have to really do a lot of work. So GC says Buff will even put a CE in place that he likes. It definitely. He influenced the whole situation, especially if it's a struggling company, because their capital is dependent upon them being able to get management that they want. Right. And we saw the same thing with uh, you may know and remember this when Theo invested in Facebook. He brought I forgot the name of that woman into Facebook because she was an experienced manager because he understood for us to continue to do capital raises. We can't have no 20 something year old trying to manage this company. So we got to bring in experienced people that have a track record of invest, uh, you know, managing in this particular space to attract the type of capital that we're going to really need to really scale this thing out. Right. And because he was the, I think the angel investor, he was able to kind of make that call. So that's kind of how this game works. What's going, what's going to Erica smartphone, classic com smartphone money. Them Texas schools going to be lit the next five years. Yeah, they will. Want to see what Texas does, though, because I think they in the SEC. I uh, want to see how they play. That's the biggest thing. They go, Texas always has the money, but I want to see, can they put it on the field? That's the biggest thing. What's going on with girls with pearls? So GC says them donors done got white folks out of presidencies, definitely. Michelle Green says they got the Texas A&M football coach out of that ASAP. Yeah, they owe him a lot of money too, though. He got paid. He got paid off what he did at Florida State and Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston and Florida State paid that, got that dude set up to get paid the way he never got to work again the rest of his life ever. You know, so you go to AM, which got a lot of money. They cashed him out, even though it didn't work. So the credit solution says, I guess you can dictate how your capital is allocated based on your level of influence. I can't give a $25 check to a pot water team, replace a coach uniform, for example. You can't do 25, but it, it depends on the team and the level that they're playing at. How, what you can do. So, you know, you can influence things based on your scale, but you're one person. So the question is, how many people do you need to put together to get the level of influence that you need? Because everything is done in groups in this country. Very few people doing anything by themselves. It just looks that way on television. Right. Or it looks like that way on the Internet. A lot of these people that we think are big and we've seen this with uh with Sean Combs. I forget. I think that's his name. You know, he wasn't doing the caliber of business that we thought he was once all the documentation started to come out. But they put him out there like he is because that's what people want to see. But behind closed doors, it's not really like that. And it's like that with everybody. You know, these people are parts of groups. It's just a lot of people in the group don't want their face on the camera. So Oak was over there by Waco. OK, I feel you. I think uh, Dr. Chaz lived close to Waco at one time. So, Mr. Cadre, I was interested in how these real estate oriented fund founders articulate how they plan on delivering yield with the cost of capital and construction where it is right now. I think you probably would have to go into their prospectus and read it. And it's probably in there. Uh, so I think that's why I, I think the most important thing is reading and understanding the information that's being presented in front of you, uh, because I'm out here in the Atlanta area and they're constantly building. And they just never stop. Same thing with Orlando. Every time I go to Orlando, they're building stuff. So they, you may be too young to remember this. I don't know how old you are, but during the quote unquote, the depression between like 07 and 212, where nobody really was building, they were building in Orlando the whole time. They never stopped building. In Orlando, they just never stopped building. It never stops. They'll knock something down and put something new up, right? And they're not doing it with cash money. They're doing, they're getting it financed. Because you look at what they're building, it's getting financed. Same thing out here in Atlanta. They've never stopped building in Atlanta. They just never stopped. Right? So, again, um, I think it may be lack of exposure. There was a lot of things I didn't understand about real estate at all, period, until I started listening to people like Erica, started listening to people like Jimmy and Corey Camp. I had no idea this stuff even took place. Because I wasn't exposed to it. I was exposed to what I was exposed to. Um, there are people in Atlanta, they never stop building. I don't know how they're getting financed, but they're getting it financed and they're building. And in Orlando, 
The whole time I was out there, man, they was doing construction. And people's out there working. Erica says, Ethiopians rocking DC heavy. Definitely. Um, especially out there by the airport. There's an a R&B singer named Kalayla that was out of DC. I think she was Ethiopian. She used to put out a really good music a few years ago. I don't know where she's at now. Erica says, folks who want to invest money will find a way. Definitely, because there's more. One of the things I try to, and I don't know if you've seen this particular uh, show called The Ones Who Live. It's part of the Walking Dead series. And they got something called the Echelon Briefing, in which they kind of show you, like, this is really what we're really doing. And it's designed to kind of get you to understand the big picture. One thing I've tried to help the people I've kind of tried to teach about the markets through my trading course is to kind of understand about how capital moves in the world and the demand for return on capital. Um, but I haven't really taught it to them fully because I don't know if they really understand it. Because they have, they, they may not have enough exp experience or exposure in the markets. Um, but you're 100% correct. People that are looking to get returns on capital, they're going to find a way to do it. Right. They're going to because fund managers will get in trouble for not working the money. They just will, because why would I give somebody money to bank my money when I can put my money in the bank? I give them my money to work it. But I think people may not be aware of that, like people want to get returns on their capital. There's so much money in this world. It's ridiculous. Like it doesn't even make sense. So fourth dimension, man, I appreciate the two dollars. Yeah, it was Cheryl Sandberg. Yeah, that's her name. So he brought her in to manage because um, she had experience. So Mr. Harvey, I'm sorry, Mr. Pascal says, are you putting out a leap option of funding investing course in the future? So definitely not going to do a funding investing course. I'm going to put out a basic stock investing course because I think that's what I need to lower the uh the content to scale it out to more people, right? So I definitely going to put out a basic investing course. It's going to be very, very, very basic because to me, that's what people want. The leap options problem really is going to either be in person or um, similar to what Thierry has just done where she kind of did everything online in the studio. I like that model uh, because it's not as big as a headache as trying to secure locations and yada and trying to move people around. It's a different model. I kind of like how she did that. So that's going to probably be the two areas. But the leap option is going to be at a much higher price point because the, to me, the information necessitates the higher price point. Uh, so we got to kind of see how we're going to go with that, because that stuff is is the type of stuff that Buffett does and other people do. But they just don't they don't really tell you about it. And I talked about a little bit of that on my uh, on my channel, but I don't know if people is really receiving it. So big pop mo. If I pronounce your name right, Chris Senegal did a crowdfunding. And it was successful. He raised money, brought the property, renovated and got the people their money. Yeah, a lot of people have done the model. So we kind of talked about that. It's just, again, the Internet is like a thing that I think people think is like the only thing. You know, and it's just interesting. But I think people think like this Internet is all that there is. It's really not. It hasn't been and it's never going to be. But for I think a segment of the population, what goes on in the Internet is like their world. So they kind of don't see it um, outside of that, right? So that's pretty much going to be it. Hope you got some value from it. Stay safe and talk to you later.